Sunday nights is a little bit different, you know, the setting and, and what have you, and so I try to uh, provide a little bit more challenging material on Sunday nights um, as, as I have an opportunity. Tonight may be more of a reminder in many ways than, than challenging, but we need our reminders uh, as much as we do our challenges. Uh, would you pray with me as we begin our lesson tonight? Heavenly Father, we love you, and we thank you for loving us. A love, Father, that we can't fully comprehend, nor can we ever repay. But we thank you. We thank you for loving us and providing us this opportunity, Father, to come into your presence, to address you as not only our God, but our Father. We thank you, Father, for giving us your words whereby we can know life. Help us tonight as we look into those words, Father, to be moved and to be changed. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Memory is the God-given ability by which past uh, events can become present experiences. Memory is something that we appreciate. And there are many things that affect our memories. Um, I'm, for, Susie doesn't say it anymore, but you know I'm a nomad. And I've lived so many different places, my father being in the Marine Corps, and we were someplace different every year. And when a song would come on the radio, I said, oh, that's from 1971. And she's like, well, how do you know that? And I said, because I was in Quantico, Virginia in the fourth grade when that song came out. And I was somewhere different every year, you know. And so it was, it, you assign uh, different memories to where you were. Now, if... If memory were not important, God would have not given us memories. And then it's funny how we can remember things that we probably would prefer not to and can't remember the things that we would like to. Memory's a funny thing. And as we get older, sometimes our memories fade away. I've known a lot of people in their 90s and, and even into their hundreds who had perfect recollection. And I've known people in their 50s and 60s that struggled to remember what they did this morning. Uh, memory is, is, a, is a strange thing. But God gave us our memories for a reason. And memory is something that God expects us to use. God's Old Testament people, the, the children of Israel, were charged with remembering. That's what the whole book of Deuteronomy is about. The second giving of the law, as they've wandered through the wilderness, the, the rebellious people have died. Forty years, they're about to enter the land and you go through the book of Deuteronomy, and it's remember, 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 over and over again. God wants us to remember certain things, and these things are very important. Jesus stressed the importance of remembering. As he institutes the Lord's Supper in Luke chapter 22 and verse 19, he says, do this in, rem in remembrance of me. Sometimes we need help remembering. We do. We make lists. We do all kinds of things. Jesus gave us the unleavened bread and the fruit of the vine so that we didn't forget. You know, there's something interesting about this before I move forward with the lesson. We, we could sing songs that were scriptural songs and never mention Calvary. There's plenty of songs. We could pray scriptural prayers and never mention Calvary. The cross. In our giving, the idea of the cross never comes to mind, but perhaps it does for you on occasion. But the person leading the prayer may not mention the cross. And, and you could have a sound doctrine, perfectly scriptural lesson that would not mention the cross. But you can't do this without remembering the cross. The cross is always at, at the center of what we do on the Lord's Day because it's brought to our memory. And so our memories are really important. And so when Jesus says, do this in remembrance of me, he's telling us we need to keep this in the forefront of our minds because we have to remember the price that was paid for us to have what we have and to be what we are to be. I would invite you to join me in Luke 24, verses 1 through 8. Jesus had died the, the previous Friday. He'd been in the tomb 
for several days. Now, on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they and certain other women with them came to bring to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared. But they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. Then they went in and did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And it happened as they were greatly perplexed about this, that behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. Then as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth, they said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise again. And they remembered his words. They remembered his words. I would like to talk to you tonight about remembering Jesus' words. Remembering Jesus' words. There are many reasons why we should. Uh, we could go through our New Testaments over and over and over again and find constant reminders of the things that Jesus said and why we should remember those things. But tonight I, I want to give you four things that we need to hang on to. And these four things are really important for a number of reasons. First of all, Jesus spoke with regarding these things, but they're, they're the bases for uh, all that we do, the work that we do, the things that we believe, and these are things that we need to bear in mind as we seek to reach out to others who may not know Jesus in the forgiveness of their sins. We need to remember his words about salvation. We need to remember his words about faithfulness, about giving, and about heaven. Because all of these things are intertwined. They are intertwined with one another. And they are part and parcel of the existence day in and day out of the Christian life. Now, we, we talk about heaven uh, I want to go to heaven. Well, what are you doing to get there? Well, I'm raising my kids right, and I'm doing this, that. You know, you can raise your kids any way you want to. It's not going to get you to heaven. What is heaven? Well, there's a new show that's coming out. Oh, yeah. Saw it advertised this weekend. Have you seen it? No. There's a show coming out. And the lady is sitting at the table, and there's an angel on the other side as a, dressed as a man and says, you're dead. And she went, and he went, oh, you're, you're up there. She was in heaven. And on the ad, it shows her waking up one morning, and she said, heaven is great because I drank all that wine last night, and I didn't wake up with a hangover. So I can only imagine the nonsense that's going to come out of that show because that's what the world thinks about these things. We need to make sure we remember Jesus' words. Okay? And then we can help others. You know, we can use TV shows like that to, to start spiritual conversations, people. You know, we don't need to just boycott and ban and do all these things that people tell us to do. But sometimes we need to watch them so we can see just to know what's going on and so that when somebody brings it up, we can have a conversation with them. Open that door. Open the door to open up the Bible. It's really important for us. Let's talk about salvation for just a moment in Jesus' words. Join me in Hebrews chapter 2, 1 through 3. Hebrews chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. Now this is a, a group of Christians who definitely needed some reminders. They were struggling there uh, in the late 60s. Therefore, we must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest we drift away. For if the word spoken through angels proved steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord, and was confirmed to us by those who heard him? Here, the Hebrew writer is speaking with regards to the importance of salvation. And how during Old Testament times, the word that had been mediated through angels received punishment when people disobeyed it. How much more should we expect 
if we disobey the word that came directly from the mouth of Jesus. In Luke chapter 24, toward the end of the chapter, where we were just a moment ago, Jesus, uh, Luke's recording of, of the Great Commission, and, and I, I don't believe there was one Great Commission. When you read the Great Commissions, you, you see Jesus saying different things. I, I think the Great Commissions that are recorded in Matthew, Mark, and Luke were three different occasions during that 40-day period. And there's very likely one of those was right prior to the time that he ascended. Here he says, Thus it is written, and thus was necessary for Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. Here he is telling those that did not believe that he had talked to for three and a half years that he was going to have to die, be buried, and raised. He's telling them it was necessary for these things to happen, and now we need to preach repentance and remission of sins. Repentance and remission of sins. In Matthew 28, Beginning in verse 18, he says, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe whatever things I've commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always to the end of the age. Jesus says in Mark chapter 16, 15 and 16, Go and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. He who does not believe will be condemned. Now, when you combine those three statements together, you get a real good idea of what Jesus is charging us with doing. And that's preaching salvation. Because it is the one thing that every person on earth needs that they can't get themselves. Every person needs to be saved. We need to remember that the Lord had to be lifted up. He tells us in John chapter 3, 14 through 16, that as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. He goes on to tell us in verse 17, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Saved. Salvation. But it required Jesus being lifted up on the cross. We have this convoluted idea that when Jesus says, and I, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men to myself. And there are people here in 2016 that believe that's talking about praising Jesus. Look at the context. The context of what Jesus was talking about was being lifted up on the cross. By this, he signified the death he would die. It's not about praising Jesus. Yes, we do need to praise him. We need to lift him up in praises, but this idea of being lifted up is about his death for our salvation. His death for our salvation. We need to remember and honor his death in the partaking of the Lord's Supper. We talked about that just a few moments ago. We remember the, the bread. Uh, the body through the bread. We remember the blood through the cup. These are important remembrances for us. We need to remember the correlation between the church and salvation. I'm not preaching churchianity, folks, but you can't be saved and not be in the body of Christ. Go to Ephesians chapter 2. <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 2, beginning in verse 14. Speaking of Jesus, for he himself is our peace, who has made both one, both there's Jews and Gentiles, has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is, the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace and that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. Now, 
we don't want to just exhaust these verses, but we could for hours and hours and hours. But he takes Jews and Gentiles. He takes down the thing that separated them, which was the law of Moses. That's what separated Jews from Gentiles. It set his people apart through which he would bring Messiah into the world. He breaks down the middle wall of separation and reconciles both Jews and Gentiles to God. Reconcile, reestablishes a relationship in one body through the cross. One body. Ephesians chapter 1, 22 and 23 tells us that Christ is the head of the church, his body. If you go to Colossians chapter 1 and verse 18, he makes the exact opposite statement. He says Christ is the head of the body, the church. So when you see the body being mentioned, it's the church. When you see the church being mentioned, it's the body. To be reconciled to God, we have to be in that one body that is brought to the Father by Jesus Christ, by the cross. In chapter 5, we, we spend a lot of time talking about marriage in chapter 5. And our marriages are supposed to reflect Jesus' relationship to the church. It's very important for us to recognize that. But in 5.23, it says that Jesus is the Savior of the body. If you're not in that body, are you going to be saved? You've got to be in the body. Salvation is only for those that have been reconciled to God in one body. We have to be in that body. And Jesus is the head of the church. Well, well, I, I want Jesus, but I don't want the church. I want Jesus, but I don't want religion. How many times do we hear that today? So you want the head without the body. Now, what is that? You know what a head without a body is? It's dead. It's dead. The head has to be connected to the body in order to be alive. And it's the head that gives instruction to the body on how it is to function. That's a really important thing to remember because this is just not an example that Paul brings forward. It is an expired, excuse me, inspired idea to explain to us how connected Jesus is to his church, the body. Secondly, we need to remember Jesus' words about faithfulness. In John chapter 15, 1 through 8, Jesus the night he was betrayed, as he is giving his final instructions to his um, apostles, minus Judas, who has already left to go betray him. First eight verses of chapter 15 in John. I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so you will be my disciples. To abide in him. Now he's, he's gone and he's taken this idea of a body, and he's moved it into a plant. And he's the vine, and we're the branches, the offshoots of the vine. Now, just as a body cannot function without a head, neither can a branch function without a vine. You have to stay grafted in or firmly implanted in that vine in order to serve your function as a disciple. What do you do to a plant to keep it healthy? Well, you got to water it, absolutely. But you know what you have to do every so often that's not real pleasant for the plant? you got to trim it. 
And what do you trim? The health? Do you, do you cut off the healthy branches or the dead branches? The ones that are not bearing leaves or fruit, you cut those off. You don't want any more energy going into those branches because they're not doing you any good. You want the energy going into the other branches. And the ones that bear fruit, then you prune those so that even more fruit will come. Jesus is talking about not only abiding in him, but he's talking about our faithfulness. Abide in me occurs five times in these eight verses. It means to remain steadfastly in place. And in order to abide in Christ, we must first be in Christ. Galatians 3, 26 and 27. You are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of us have been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. Literally clothed in Christ. Romans 6, 3 and 4. For do you not know that as many of us were baptized into Christ, were baptized into his death? Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death. These are the only two verses that tell us how to get into Christ. And I know this is a reminder, but we're talking about our memories. We're trying to bring some back into our memory the, the ideas here so that we can be firmly uh, convinced of these things, so we can share them effectively with others. To abide in Christ, He must abide in us. Verse 4. Now think about that. That's a reciprocal relationship between Jesus and us. So if, if we choose to remove ourselves, there's no abiding. But if Jesus chooses to remove himself, there's no abiding. It is a reciprocal relationship. Now Jesus isn't going to leave for just no good reason. We might, and we do. Christians every day leave the, the care and the protection of God for really no good reason whatsoever. We abide in Him by abiding in His body, the church. We must remain faithful to Christ. That means being faithful to His body. This is so important for us to remember. So important. You know, we didn't make this stuff up. This was handed down to us for over 1,900 years. These are the things that the apostles taught. And then they wrote. And then these have been preserved by the Holy Spirit and translated into many different languages coming down to our day where we have it in our native tongue, which is English. It's been faithfully transmitted to us. And we need to remember. We need to remember about giving. There's a statement that Paul makes in uh, Acts chapter 20 and verse 35 that you don't find anywhere in the Gospels. And it's a quotation of Jesus. We remember the words of the Lord where he said, it is better to give than to receive. It is better to give than to receive. We heard some remarks around the table this morning about that. And it's so, so telling when we think about giving and how much more, well, blessed according to this, but it's, it's a pleasant, it's fun, it's joyful to give to someone and see the happiness that is on their face when we give to them. When we provide something for them, whether it's a gift or a need, it doesn't matter. It's a beautiful thing to see. Jesus taught us in Matthew chapter 16, or chapter 6, beginning of verse 19, to lay up our treasures in heaven where moth does not eat or rust does not destroy nor thief breaks in and steals. Our treasures are to be laid up in heaven because where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Very important for us to remember these things. We treasure up for ourselves many things. I, ha I have a me box. Anybody have a me box? 
I went to 10 schools, kindergarten through 12th grade, from Northern Virginia to Southern California. I didn't have the, the luxury of going kindergarten through high school graduation with the same people like my wife did. And so I have a me box, and it has a couple of things from just about everywhere I've lived. Either something I collected or a program from a school or any of those kinds of things. And, and that's, they're not treasures, but they're great memories. And maybe one day they'll mean something to, to my sons or grandchildren if the Lord blesses us with grandchildren. Or maybe they'll just see it as junk and throw it into the fire and burn it. But at any rate, um, it, you know, it just kind of keeps me connected to different things in my past. Having things, there's nothing wrong with things, but what do we do with them? You know, I don't have them up on a shelf and I don't burn incense to those things. They're in a box in my closet. And, it, and if I think of something or, or one of my sons or my wife says something, I'll go in there and I'll dig it. Oh, here it is right here. And then it goes back in the box, it goes back in the closet. But we talked this morning about how important it was for us not to place our confidence in our material things. Moths. You ever had a garment that a moth got into? Yeah, they don't get into your cheap stuff, do they? Yes. My, my mom, for Christmas, got me a Christian Dior scarf that was cashmere when I was in college. And I had a long walk from where I could park on campus to where classes were, and I loved that scarf. Oh, that scarf was outstanding because I could wrap it around, and I would stay so toasty inside that scarf. And I put it in the drawer, and I come back next year, and it's now a Sunday scarf because it's holy. Right? You know, moths tear things up. You ever had anything rust on you? Yeah, it happens, doesn't it? And, and it's, it's so disappointing because it's something that, that you like or, or you wanted or something that was important to you, and then you go back to, to find it and find out that for some reason moisture has interacted with it and it began to oxidize and you have rust and it's now worthless. Have you ever had somebody break in and steal something from you? It's not a pleasant thing, is it? Jenny just experienced that very recently, she and Mark. The first time I can remember that happening in a way where it really affected me is when uh, my grandfather died in 1981. And I had to come home from college. And uh, while we were at the cemetery burying my grandfather, people broke into the house and took everything of value from my grandmother's house. Ever since that point in time, whenever we do a memorial service, I always recommend that somebody stay at their, the people's house. Because if somebody reads the paper, they're going to think there's not going to be anybody there. It's not a pleasant thing, but you know, things are things. They really are, no matter what kind of memories are attached to them. They are things, and we need to lay our treasures up in heaven, because that's the only place where they're going to last forever. Those things will carry forward. You see, we give because when we give, we become like God who is a giver. We talked about John 3.16 a moment ago. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. In 2 Corinthians 9.15, Paul writes, Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. God is a giver. We need to be givers. Yes, we need to give our time. Yes, we need to give our talents. But, you know, we need to come off our pocketbooks and we need to, to give. There are plenty of people that need something other than your time or your talent. Because you can't take it with you. I think it was my senior year in high school. There was a news report, and I think Time Magazine had a story about it. There was a rich oil guy in Texas that died. You know what his coffin was? His Cadillac, Fleetwood Brome, gold, with long horns on, on the hood. And there he is, and they've got him all dressed up and nowhere to go. 
and they put him in the ground. You remember that? A resident Texan, of course, he would remember that. But it just it just shocked me. Now, I don't know. People hang on to the strangest things. We really do. God is a giver, and he calls for us to give. You can't take it with you as something we need to bear in mind every single day. No matter what it is, we can't take it with us. The only thing that we take with us into eternity is our soul. And what can you give in exchange for your soul? Remembering Jesus' words. When we give, we become like the Lord. 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 9 says, Though he was rich, he became poor, that we might become rich through his poverty. Jesus didn't consider the wealth of heaven anything. Because coming to earth was more important than dying for us. We need to die. And we need to remember Jesus' words about heaven. In John chapter 14, beginning in verse 1, Jesus has, has just completely demoralized his disciples. One of you is going to betray me. You're all going to abandon me tonight. Peter says, I, they might, but I'm not going to. Peter, you're going to deny me three times before the rooster crows. Oh, I'll never deny you. They, they were sorrowful. They were troubled in heart. And Jesus says, let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way you know. And Thomas said, Lord, how can we know where you're going? How can we know the way? And Jesus answered and said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. Many mansions those mansions are dwelling places. We shouldn't think of it as like an antebellum mansion that you see, might see on a movie set or something like that. Um, but many dwelling places in heaven. Heaven is going to be a prepared place. You ever showed up somewhere and that place was not prepared for what you were showing up for? Has that ever happened to you? Yeah, it happens a lot, doesn't it? Have you ever been the person that was responsible for being prepared and something got in the way and you couldn't quite get prepared in time for everybody to show up? Happens, doesn't it? That's not going to happen to Jesus. It's not going to be, hey, wait just a minute. I've got a subcontractor that didn't show up. Nope. It's going to be perfectly prepared. Perfectly suitable for eternity. There's nothing that is going to be missing in heaven. Jesus told the truth about life and the life to come. He told us the truth about these things. We need to remember what he said. First of all, heaven is a real place. It's not some place where we're going to go get drunk and not wake up with a hangover, like this television show is showing. It's not going to be a place where every one of our fantasies is fulfilled. That's not what heaven is. Heaven is a glorious place. And we assign so many materialistic things to heaven that we, we downgrade what heaven is. Because I, I am fully convinced that the only reason that John uses the description of heaven that he gives us in Revelation is because there were no words to describe it. He could only come up with jewels and precious metals Streets of clear gold. Gates out of a single pearl. Twelve foundations, each of them a precious gem. You know, 
words are inadequate to describe heaven. The only thing that's going to allow us to understand what heaven is is to be there. That's the only way we're going to know. It's a real place. In heaven, the things that, that mar this life will forever be in the past. Revelation 21 and verse 4 talks about there be no death, no hunger, no sickness, no pain. All of those things will be gone. There will also be no sin. Not only will there not be sin to, to interrupt your life, but you won't be the one that's sinning either. No sin will be present in heaven. And there's only one way to get there. We've got to remember Jesus' words. I had a conversation a couple of years ago with someone who was a universalist, and they felt like, you know, all good dogs go to heaven. You know, everybody, if you're just a good person, you can go to heaven. And I said, well, John 14, 6 says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but through me. That's what Jesus says. Well, there is that, was the response. Yeah, well, there is that. Because Muhammad can't make that claim. Buddha can't make that claim. L. Ron Hubbard can't make that claim. None of your celebrities or sports idols or your parents or grandparents or grandchildren or children, no, nobody can make that claim. There is only one way to the Father, and that's through Jesus himself. Now, either Jesus was completely delusional, he was lying through his teeth, or the truth is he's the only way to heaven. Now, you've got to make up your mind which it is you believe it is. I can't make up your mind for you. You have to make up your own mind. And I'm telling you, there are people that you're running into each and every day that have no clue what that means. Well, if I just raise my kids right, and, you know, and I give some stuff to United Way, then I'll be okay. Because I'm not nearly as bad as the guy that lives next door to me. Right? Everything's subjective. Jesus says there is no subjectivity. It's all objective. You're either in me or you're not. You either abide in me or you don't. You're either part of my body or you're not. You either have the heart of a giver or not. We began there in Luke chapter 24 and verse 8. Then they remembered his words. We need to remember his words. We need to remember what he said, not only about these four subjects, but about everything, but in particular, these four subjects, because I'm telling you, the people that you run across day in and day out are going to have questions about those four things. Well, why, why do you go to church on Sunday? It's such a pretty day. Why don't we go hiking? Why don't we go golfing? We can go fishing. We can go down to the shore. You know, there's some Sundays that I wake up and I see how beautiful it is. And I think, you know, it would be nice to go and do. But I've got an appointment with God today, and I'm not going to break my appointment. I've got a standing appointment with Him, and nothing's going to get in the way of that. Have you remembered His words? Jesus at the end of the Sermon on the Mount says, Therefore, whoever hears these words of mine and does them, I will liken to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rains descended and the floods came and the wind blew and beat against that house. And it stood, for it was founded on the rock. But whoever hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like the foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rains descended and the floods came, and the wind blew and beat on that house, and it fell, and great was its destruction. That's Jesus' commentary on whether or not we listen to and do his words. And so I'll leave you with this question. Have you obeyed his words? Have you obeyed his words? Because let me tell you, that's the only thing in this life that matters. That's all that matters. All the rest of it is window dressing. 
and all the philosophies of men and all the wonderful things, the yarns that people spin about this, that, and the other, none of it's going to matter. Jesus said in John chapter 12 and verse 48, He who rejects me and does not receive my word has that which judges him. The word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. Our standard of judgment will be the words of Christ. And that's what we need to remember. I hope I've brought to your memory some things tonight that are important to you. Maybe some things that you knew or perhaps even uh, a different perspective on some things that you've heard in the past. But folks, we, we need to remember Jesus' words. And we need to keep those things close to our heart and in the forefront of our minds. Jesus expects us to. He expects us to remember. And oh, it's so easy to get distracted and forget. That's the way of humanity. We forget so easily. But Jesus loves you. He was lifted up on that cross to die for you. God gave him for that specific purpose so that you could be saved, so that you could spend eternity in that beautiful, prepared place. If you have not obeyed Jesus' words, if you have not believed in Jesus as the Son of God, repented of your sins, confessed His precious name, and been immersed in water for the remission of those sins, that is, baptized, and raised to walk in a new life, I encourage you to start today John 14, 6 is just as true today as it was when Jesus spoke those words over 1,900 years ago. He is the only way to the Father. You cannot get to heaven without Him. If you're here tonight and you've done those things and maybe you have been remiss in following Jesus' words, maybe you've allowed sin to creep into your life, maybe discouragement has come. Maybe there are other difficulties that you're facing, uh, circumstances for which you want prayers. We're about to sing a song. Jim's going to lead us in this song. Whatever need that you have, won't you please make it known to us as together we stand and as we sing.